Hey friends of words, what's up? Today we're going to talk about a short story called A Good Man is Hard to Find. It's written by Flannery O'Connor and was first published in 1953 in a collection of short stories titled A Good Man is Hard to Find. Now, let's look at the summary of this short story. The story opens with a grandmother trying to convince her son to take a trip to Tennessee where she wanted to meet up with some of her connections. Her son Bailey and his family on the other hand wanted to head to Florida. The grandmother lives with her son Bailey, her innocent cabbage-faced daughter-in-law, her grandson John Wesley, her granddaughter June Star and a toddler. Despite the grandmother trying to convince Bailey to go to Tennessee, citing all sorts of reasons, including the presence of an escaped convict in Florida, the family does not budge and it is confirmed as the destination. On the day of the trip, the grandmother hides her cat in a basket and puts her in the car. She sits with June and John on either side of her. The children engage in their banter and John calls Tennessee a hillbilly dumping ground, resulting in his grandmother chastising him. She then narrates a rather funny story of her suitor named Edgar Atkins Tea Garden. He used to bring a watermelon for her every day, leaving it on her porch with his initials on them, resulting in a black child eating it, mistaking the initials E A T as an instruction. And Ruth, the family stops at a restaurant called The Tower, which is owned by Red Sammy Butts. Red Sammy mentions people are becoming more and more untrustworthy these days, quoting one incident from the recent past where he let two decent looking men buy gas on credit. A conversation about misfit, the escaped convict, starts somehow, and the woman worries that he will rob them. Sammy laments that good men are hard to find these days, and the world is worse off for it. The family gets on the road again, and the grandmother takes her intermittent naps, waking up from one to realize that she had visited a plantation in the past and wanted to see it again. Knowing fully well that her son will not entertain the idea of stopping to look at that place, she crafts a story about the house with a plantation that has secret panels. This spurs the children's imagination, and they start yelling and screaming to visit that place. Bailey, who is completely against the idea at first, finally agrees to take the family there to handle the ruckus children had created. The grandmother points him to a dirt road and the family drives deep into the woods. But then the grandmother suddenly realizes that the house that she was mentioning was actually in Tennessee. Petrified, her feet jerked, upsetting the cat. The cat then jumps on a startled Bailey's shoulder and he loses control of the car. Although the car is wrecked, the family escapes unhurt with the exception of Bailey's wife who had a broken shoulder. The grandmother decides not to mention anything about her mistake to her son, who is fuming at this point. They wait for someone to come by so that they could seek their help. Then they see a car approaching from far away and the grandmother waves her arms dramatically to attract their attention. The car stops and three armed men come out of it. The grandmother has a strange feeling that she recognizes one of those men. One of those men asks the mother of the children to settle her children down as they make him nervous. The grandmother, suddenly realizing that one of the men is misfit, screams out at misfit with recognition, upsetting her son who curses violently at her. She starts crying and the man starts consoling her. She asks if he would shoot a lady and the man mentions that it wouldn't be his preference. The grandmother keeps telling him that he's a good man and he agrees to that. He then calls his own mother the finest woman and his dad to have a heart of pure gold. Hiram and Bobby Lee, the other two men, take Bailey and John into the woods. The conversation continues between the grandmother and Misfit. Misfit agrees that he is not a good man, but not the worst either. He apologizes to the ladies for not wearing a shirt because they had to bury their clothes after they escaped. He mentions that they borrowed the clothes they are wearing from some people they met on their way. The grandmother asks Misfit if he prays, to which he says no. Two gunshots fill the air. Misfit tells the grandmother that he was not a bad child, but remembers having gone to the prison for the crime that he didn't remember committing. He told that he got to know from a psychiatrist that he had killed his own father, but Misfit has no memory of this whatsoever. The grandmother urges him to pray so that Jesus could help him. Misfit denies doing that as he does not need any help and he is doing good by himself. Bobby Lee and Hiram come back from the woods without Bailey and John 
and hand over a shirt to Misfit. Misfit asks the children's mother to take the child and June Star with her and go with Bobby Lee and Hiram. Bobby Lee tries to hold June Star's hand, who ridicules him for looking like a pig. Realizing her soon to be fate, the grandmother starts chanting Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Misfit thinks himself to be like Jesus, except that he had not committed a crime. He calls himself Misfit because he thinks that the punishment that people get for their crimes do not fit their crimes. The grandmother hears gunshots again, three this time, and cries out for Bailey. She implores him to not shoot an old lady. Misfit continues his conversation about Jesus, saying that Jesus confused everyone by raising from the dead because if he actually did that, then everyone should follow him. But if he didn't actually do that, then indulging in meanness in one life is a natural thing for people to do. The grandmother agrees that perhaps Jesus didn't. Misfit wishes he was there to see Jesus raising the dead and then he would have known for sure. Seeing Misfit's voice breaking and face contorted as he was going to cry, in a moment of clarity, the grandmother calls Misfit, one of my own babies, and touches him on the shoulder. As if bitten by a snake, Misfit springs on his feet and shoots her in the chest three times. Bobby Lee and Hiran return, remarking on the grandmother being a talker. Misfit observes that the grandmother could have been a good woman if someone was there to shoot her every moment of her life. He then goes on to say, that life has no true pleasure. So that was the summary of A Good Man is Hard to Find. Let's do a quick analysis of the story. There is a quality to this story that's haunting to the core. The author paints a picture of a regular family taking a trip to Tennessee, talking about things that any regular family talks about, including the news, which happens to have a story of a cruel murderer who is on the run from the law. No one in the family, in fact, not even the reader of the story, expects the murderers to actually meet the family in the end and then kill them in cold blood. There's a bone-chilling aspect to this story. The further you go in the story, the scarier it becomes, mostly because of the fear of what's going to happen next. It's a true classic. The accolades that a good man is hard to find has received is a testimony of that fact. This is certainly Flannery O'Connor's best work. First published in 1953, this story has inspired a lot of scholarly and on-screen adaptations. For example, this story was adapted into a film called Black Hearts Bleed Red in 1992 and a modern chamber opera in 2003. So that was all for A Good Man is Hard to Find. If you like this video, then please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, Friends of Words. Thank you.